Cool. So now we've got to talk about equations of state. And what was the original equation of state for a gas that you learned way back in the day? Again, in Gen Chem? What was it? Yeah, PV equals NRT. Now, for that to be true, though, we derive that from what we call the kinetic model of gases, or sometimes kinetic molecular theory as applied to gases. And so we've got to look at this kinetic model for gases. And this kinetic model for gases really has three big assumptions. And they're on your hand out there. So, and the first one is just that gas molecules are in constant random motion. Sometimes you'll see other sources, you know, explain this out a little further and say it's straight line motion until they collide with something, either the wall of the container, another molecule, whatever. But constant random motion. So, but the more, the two more important assumptions, at least for the purpose of the discussion that's going to follow, are the second two assumptions. The next assumption is that the gas molecules have negligible volume. And essentially we say negligible, which ultimately we treat as gas molecules have no volume. That's how we treat it. We say they have no volume. Does that make any sense? Don't molecules have volume? <coughs> so why do we, you know, how do we get away with making this assumption then? They're so tiny compared to what? It's all relative. Under most conditions, gas molecules are so small compared to the amount of space between them and the next gas molecule. And so if you look at the total volume of a gas, the amount of that total volume that the little teeny tiny molecules takes up is insignificant compared to the total volume. So most of that sample of a gas is made up of empty space, empty space. And so this is so small that the, the, the part of that space the molecules actually take up under most conditions is so small that we just ignore it. It's negligible. That's the second assumption. So this assumption is most accurate when we have very large volumes. When do gases take up large volumes? So. That'll be part of it, a little bit, but we usually relate this one more to pressure than temperature. Low pressure. Molecules are really spread out when they're under low pressures. <coughs> I'll summarize this next one, a little bit of an oversimplification, but we say there are no attractive forces between the molecules is the last assumption we make. No attractive forces between molecules, but, or atoms for that matter. But atoms and molecules all have attractive forces. What kind of attractive forces do we talk about for atoms and molecules? Hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole forces, London dispersion forces, those are all intermolecular forces and they all have them, right? Everything in the universe has London forces. So this is never 100% correct. So the idea here is that for the kinetic model of gases, these gas molecules don't experience any interaction with each other except for the brief second that they actually, you know, the brief instant where they collide with each other. That's it. But other than that, you know, if this molecule's over here and this one's way over here, they don't feel each other at all. It's not technically 100% correct. So, however, as long as the gas molecules have a huge amount of kinetic energy compared to the, you know, the, the strength of these attractive forces, it's not a bad assumption. When do molecules have a lot of kinetic energy? high temperature. And so this is not a bad assumption at high temperature. And so this kinetic model of gases works fairly well at low pressures and high temperatures. So, but if you start getting to significant pressures or low <laughs> temperatures, it kind of breaks down. So notice, let's say I took a gas, like the heated steam, the superheated steam we had in the can a minute ago, and I took that gas and I start cooling it down. What is every gas eventually going to do? Turn into a liquid. So perfect gases, if they ever existed all the time, never would. Because perfect gases don't have these. Notice, why does a gas actually condense into a liquid? They get closer together. That's part of it. They cool down. That's part of it. So let's say that Lauren, Jessica, and me are all gas molecules. 
And we're at a certain high temperature. And so because we're at a high temperature, we're moving fairly quickly. We have fairly good RMS speeds. You know, some average higher, slower. You know, if you bump into the wall, you might slow down or speed up, depending on the, the condition, stuff like that. But we have a fairly high average speed. But as you start lowering that temperature, we start slowing down. And the whole time I've been, you know, moving around quickly, I've been like, I can get away from you. I know I can feel that attraction, but I'm getting away. So, but now I'm slowing down. I'm like, oh, I can't get away from you. And all of a sudden, we all just coalesce or condense into a liquid. We don't have enough kinetic energy to overcome the attractive forces we are feeling. And so at a low temperature, those attractive forces win, and gases turn into liquids. Cool. Well, if we had a perfect gas, perfect gases, we usually just consider this non-existent. Well, it's only non-existent you know, for higher temperatures. So in like 273 Kelvin, 298 Kelvin, or even higher and higher, so usually adequate. But you know, go down to like, I don't know, minus 77 degrees Celsius. Ah, this doesn't really work so well anymore. So, and the further we get away from these lovely conditions, the less accurate the perfect gas model becomes. Cool, so using this kinetic model for gases, we derived the perfect gas equation. And what is the perfect gas equation of state again? So, and sometimes you'll see this rearranged as just solving for pressure, and pressure equals NRT over V. Or sometimes you'll see this written in terms of uh, molar volume. And you'll see So RT over VM, and here VM, called the molar volume, or the volume of a mole of gas, is just equal to the volume per mole, you know, per moles of gas. So we'll see this molar volume and even other molar quantities used quite a bit. This little anything sub M typically means molar quantity, the amount for one mole. So if you notice, if you substitute this right back in here, you'll end up back with our original expression. So, but just different ways of seeing the perfect gas law. So, and this you guys saw in Gen Chem. In your homework, you had quite a few calculations involving this, right? Were they difficult calculations? Did anybody struggle with them in any respect? Ever, for any of the problems? So, the only place you, well, at least I shouldn't say the only place, but the most likely place you were gonna struggle, if you were gonna struggle, was on the units. On the units. Let's look at our gas constant for a minute. So I'll give you a big textbook with different, or text box, I should say, with different gas constants on there. What was the most common value of the gas constant you used back in Gen Chem? Yeah, 0 0.08206. And what were the units back in the day? Liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. That's what you most commonly used back in the day in Gen Chem. Notice that one's on the sheet, sort of, at least the number value is, but a few more sig figs. We like more sig figs, you know, we like better accuracy and stuff like that. However, we don't usually talk about liters anymore. For whatever reason, it's not proper, even though it's the same thing as decimeters cubed. So a liter and a decimeter cubed are the same thing. So one liter equals one decimeter cubed, same as one milliliter equals one Centimeter cubed. How many milliliters are in a liter? A thousand. How many centimeters cubed are in a decimeter cubed? A thousand. So, and that's where some students get hung up, is that when they're converting from, like, say, centimeters cubed to decimeters cubed, <coughs> let's look at a diff slightly different question for a sec. How many centimeters are in a decimeter? Ten. But we're not talking about centimeters and decimeters, we're talking about centimeters cubed and decimeters cubed. And while there's only one centimeter in one decimeter, I'm sorry, where there are only 10 centimeters in one decimeter, there are 10 cubed centimeters in one cubed or just one decimeter cubed. And so that's the deal. So in this case, we often give you the units here, instead of liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, as often decimeters cubed atmospheres per mole Kelvin. But it means essentially the same exact thing. If you look also, another value of R you used in Gen Chem quite a bit was 8.314, and again on your sheet you got a few more sig figs. What were the original units on this back in the day in Gen Chem? Anybody remember? Yeah, joules per mole Kelvin. Joules per mole Kelvin. Notice joules is a measure of what? Energy. So it's a measure of energy. Notice 
per mole Kelvin, per mole Kelvin, sometimes they'll just write it as moles of the minus one, Kelvin of the minus one, same diff. Liter atmospheres is a unit of energy, just like joules <laughs> is. It's not the normal one we think of, but it totally is. So, but here we use joules, and joule is the SI unit for energy. And so another way to express this, instead of joules, it's still pressure, I'm sorry, pressure volume, but we use the SI units. What's the SI units for volume? Meter cubed. What's the SI unit for pressure? Pascal. Per mole Kelvin. Cool, so you'll see this set of units, but more commonly, well, and this would be the SI units. In a physics class, this is what we'd stick, you know, restrict ourselves to using. But, oh, we're not in physics right now, right? We're in physical chemistry. We can use anything. And so instead of using this, we often use decimeter cubed kilopascal per mole Kelvin, out of convenience sake. How many decimeters cubed are in a meter cubed? A thousand, a thousand. How many kilopascal are in a pascal? And I asked that in that fashion on purpose. One one thousandth, right? So there's a thousand decimeters cubed in a meter cubed. One one thousandth of a kilopascal equals a pascal. Because we you know, have a difference of a thousand and one one thousandth, same thing. And the units for this one are, you know, and the value is exactly, I should say, the same as we saw here. Whether I do joules per mole Kelvin, which is the same as meters cubed pascal per mole Kelvin, comes out to the same numerical value when I use decimeters cubed kilopascal per mole Kelvin. Cool. And there's another one with Tor on there and stuff like that. Here's the deal. I don't really care which value of R you use. You're probably going to have all of those given to you. So it's not like you have to memorize all those and stuff like that. They're going to be probably given to you in all likelihood. However, use the value of R. That probably best matches the, you know, the, the units of the stuff you're given. That way you do as little conversions as possible, less chance for errors. If you're given a pressure in like kilopascal, then maybe you want to go here. So if you're given a pressure in atmospheres, well, then maybe you want to go here. <coughs> so it depends. I mean, and technically, you could use any R value you want to, just which one's going to require the most conversions or least conversions out of you to do it. But that's where a lot of the problem stems, is we got a billion R values now, so in a lot of different units. And I say billion, there's like six. So all right. So if we take our kinetic model for gases and derive, and it's a lengthy derivation that you definitely don't have to know, and I'm not going to derive it for you. Um, but we can derive that pressure would equal this lovely expression here. N is the moles of gas. So you got your molar mass. This is the root mean square speed, the RMS speed. So, and then three times volume. What is RMS speed? Why do we ever, it's not an average. It's kind of like an average, but it's not an average. Why do we use this? So, well, let's say we lived in a one-dimensional universe for a minute. Just a one-dimensional universe. And it's this dimension, lengthwise across the room here. Back and, you know, forward and backward doesn't work. Up and down doesn't exist. Just this one dimension here. And gas molecules, well, if, if they're just normal gas molecules, they could potentially move in any direction, right? And so half would be moving this direction at various speeds. Half would be moving at this direction at a you know, range of speeds. But the average would come out to what if we took an average speed? Zero. And so we don't use averages. We use the root mean square instead. We take the speeds and we square them. And if you square a positive number, you get a positive number. You square a negative number, you also get a positive number. And we square them all, we add them all together, and then we square root it back out. And that gives us a root mean square speed, which in the case of you know, opposing directions, this gives us a better representation of really how fast the molecules are moving. Because if I just, oh yes, the average is zero, Chad, thank you. Really helpful, man, thanks. So, but we'll use this RMS speed. So in this case, we also, just from the ideal gas law, had this lovely equation right here. I should say the perfect gas law. So both equations for pressure. So volume shows up in the same place. And so they kind of derived this empirically back in the day. But from first principles, we can derive this, or at least P chemists can derive this for us, right? And what's nice is that it matches what we empirically derived in the perfect gas law. So pressure and volume are inversely proportional. And so in this case, if we rearrange this, so if I bring the Vs over 
and have PV equal to something, I can find that I can solve for C squared here in this case, and ultimately solve for C. And we find that C equals the square root of 3RT over M, where M is the molar mass. And that gives us a simple relationship. As long as I know, you know a molecule's temperature and molar mass, I can calculate his RMS <coughs> speed really quickly. Cool, we could extrapolate this. Anybody remember what kinetic energy, what the formula was? Yeah, one half mv squared. Or in this case, it might be like one half mc squared. And if I square this, I'm going to have temperature in there. So, and for a monatomic gas, pretty much the only energy it has, if we ignore attractive forces, is kinetic. And so all of its energy, or internal energy as we see, is kinetic energy. And we'll see that its kinetic energy depends on its temperature. Well, and its molar mass as well will get factored in, but it really depends on its temperature. The only pressure, volume, temperature thing that matters for the internal energy of a monatomic gas behaving perfectly is its temperature. If the temperature doesn't change, its internal energy doesn't change. This will become important in the next chapter. So, but internal energy depends on temperature and nothing else for a perfect gas, a perfect monatomic gas.